I invite you to again open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. By introduction, this is a series that we begin at the beginning of the year. And the title of the series is Let's Do This. Well, what? what? This is more than just some sort of cheer or some sort of encouragement to live a good life. This is let's embrace our role that God has assigned to us, that He's given to us, that He's called us to as steadfast servants, as His steadfast service. We began by looking at simply the fact that we have a God who saved us. He redeemed us. He gave his son to pay the penalty for our sin that we might know him. So we serve him and we serve him for his glory. That's what the present your bodies, your lives, your whole being is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, set apart to God, living to please God. God has rescued us. He's loved us all the way to the cross. He's made us one of his own. He's given his life to us. And so today we're called to present, to surrender our bodies as living sacrifices. Romans chapter 6 says as instruments of righteousness. And last week we looked at the fact that it's an uphill battle. The world is going to seek to conform you to its image. We were saved out of the world. We at one time, were what the Apostle Paul calls children of wrath. There was a time when we didn't know God, when, when we just accepted the philosophies of the age as truth, and yet now God has revealed truth to us through His Word and through His Son. And so we value truth, and so we allow God to change our minds, to not be conformed to the world, but to transform us by the renewing of our mind. Well, here's the deal. When you tell God, yes, here I am, like uh, Isaiah did, here am I, send me. When you say, here, I'm, I'm yours, I belong to you, I'm presenting myself to you, you have saved me, you've cleansed me, you've made me your own, here I am, God is going to use you. He's going to work in you, He's going to give you a ministry, He's going to give you a sphere of influence, He's going to give you gifts and abilities, and we work together for the common good to the local church, but we see it throughout Scripture. We remember Abraham, uh, we just in our daily Bible reading a couple of weeks ago read about Abraham, since then we've been through Isaac and uh, Jacob and Esau and Laban, pretty interesting stories as we get there. But Abraham, boldly going, obediently, carefully, circumspectly for the most part, but going where God called him to go. Joseph, who, by the way, we start reading in our daily Bible reading today and tomorrow about the, the life of this man, Joseph, who is known for serving God and rises to the ranks of Egyptian politics for, through God's will. You remember the story of Moses in the Old Testament. Moses, who God called, raised in Pharaoh's palace, and then God called to lead the children of Israel across the wilderness. Jeremiah, a young man facing a declining nation, a young man facing a nation who had gone away from God, calling them back to God. He says in Jeremiah chapter 1 that he, he can't do this. He can't do what God's called him to do. He's too young. He's not equipped. And the Lord said, hey, listen, I'm here. I am with you. I will lead you through this task. I knew you before you were born. I knew you as you were shaped in your mother's womb. And I've got a task and a calling for you. And recently, at Christmas, we need to be like Mary, who said, Lord, I am the servant. I am your servant. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. You do what you want to do in me and through me. I want to be a steadfast servant of God in a world that does not serve God. And as soon as you say that, he, he will. He takes you, he uses you, he shapes you, he molds you. And after having read Romans chapter 1, I mean chapter 12 verses 1 and verse 2, you think, all right, now, now we'll get to the list of tasks and abilities and gifts and ways that God will use us. But no, he immediately goes to a, a warning. The first phrase in verse 3, after he thanks God for the grace given to him, he says, for the grace, by, by the grace that God has given to me, I, I, I want everyone not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but rather think with sober judgment. When God uses you, we have a tendency, we have a temptation right off the bat to take credit for it, to feel pretty good about ourselves. To move into the realm of pride. The name of this morning's message is No Room for Pride. Can you imagine 
Someone coming up to Jeremiah in his old age and saying, listen, God used you so mightily to proclaim his word throughout a nation that was in distress and a nation that was having such a difficult time. And Jeremiah saying, oh, yeah, not too bad, huh? And feeling pretty good about himself, a little tendency to pride there. Or Moses, the people coming up to Moses and saying, Moses, man, when we were stuck before the, the, the Red Sea, you stuck out your staff, and God parted the waters. And when we were thirsty, you, you spoke to the rock, or you struck the rock, and God sent water. And when we had no food, you prayed, and God sent food. Moses, you're the man. And can you picture in your mind Moses feeling a little bit like, yeah, maybe, maybe I'm the man. Or what about Mary, the, the woman who was commissioned with raising Christ? Can you imagine what that could have been like at some of those PTA meetings in early uh, yeah. Jerusalem? How's your kid doing? Let me tell you how my kid's doing. He's just great, perfect all the time. Here's the deal. All of us have a fleshly tendency to be self-focused, to be prideful, to be arrogant. That's why before chapter 12, he starts talking about the gifts and the different expressions of these gifts and the ways that we serve as steadfast servants of God. He says, he deals with the issue of pride. Knowing this, God puts this exhortation through Paul right at the very beginning. And it seems out of place, but it's not. By the grace given to me, Paul says, I'm where I am and able to teach you this because God has extended great, given grace to me. He's called me as an apostle. I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment last week the third point in last week's sermon was to serve carefully and to serve boldly and you can be both careful and bold but here's he, why carefully because there are some some pitfalls and so if you're taking notes the first point on your outline is we need to be careful to fight our natural tendency to pride we need to be careful to fight we need to recognize it know that it's there but to fight our natural tendency to pride. When God works through us, it's easy for us to kind of usurp that and say, hey, look what I did. I've got this. Not too long ago, I listened to a podcast about a pastor who had risen to prominence. He's a great preacher, by the way, and I'm not going to call his name. But he was a great preacher, used mightily of God, grew a church, matter of fact, grew a, a massive congregation, and then not probably 15 years into his leadership of that congregation he just seemed to kind of crash and burn he was asked to leave his congregation in the podcast one of his staff members said we were at a conference and we were speaking he was speaking and we were going along as support and to set up and to make sure things were okay and this staff person says they picked us up at a very nice hotel and they put us in this very nice limousine and they took us to this very nice auditorium that had a marquee on it. And his name was on the marquee. And he said, we were joking in the car. And I said, buddy, they're treating us like we're something. And he said, and the pastor looked at me in the face, went all serious, and says, hey, I am something. And I want you to understand that we can look at him and say, boy, that's just terrible. But the same temptation, the same tendency is something that you and I have to to guard against. It is so easy to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Now, I want to a, a couple add to this another warning found in First Peter chapter five. And feel free to turn there. I would love for you to read that with me. It's First Peter chapter five. I'm going to read verses five through eight. Paul has just encouraged the young to. Be respectful of the elders. Likewise, you are younger, be subject to the elders. Close yourself with humility for one another. And so, be respectful, but be humble. Don't be prideful. Why? For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Now, get that. God opposes the proud. As a matter of fact, in your copy of the Scriptures, you ought to circle that. You ought to underline it. What will move you quickly from being one who is empowered by God and used by God to one who is being opposed by God? When it is God is your opponent. A prideful attitude that you do not deal with, that you not confess and repent of. 
When you think about serving God, being a steadfast servant, pride changes everything. It moves God from being your power and your source of strength and working through you to being your opponent. And if you don't humble yourself, he will humble you. God gives grace to the humble. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. It's about him exalting us. And we can cast our anxieties, our cares on him because he cares for you. Listen to this exhortation again. Verse 8, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Be careful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, we quote that verse a lot, or we're very familiar with that verse. But look at the context of the verse. As a matter of fact, when you see Satan in Scripture or the devil in Scripture, there's something to do. He, He goes with pride. He goes with pride, his temptation, his sin. You remember his sin, Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28. His sin was pride and arrogance in his fall. And he uses pride in the life of the church. How will he most easily attack good Christians in the life of the church? He'll make us proud of things that we shouldn't be proud of. He will make us proud of ourselves rather than of who God is and what God is doing. His, one of his favorite temptations is for us to, to, to be self-satisfied or self-concerned. I have this, quote, self-love that occupies our minds. It turns God against us. It changes us from being a channel of grace and a, a method, a means of good works for God's glory to seeking our own glory into making God our opponent. So where is this battle fought? How do you guard against the the tendency, the temptation to pride? Well, it takes place in the mind. As a matter of fact, again, not going to do any grammar here, but I will tell you this, that, that the word for think is used four times in that verse. Where he says, uh, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but think basically with good thinking. (laughs) You ought to think with sober-mindedness. It uses the same word, phreneo, for thinking. So it begins in the mind. It begins what we think, what we know, what we understand to be truth. Again, the exhortation to be renewed in the spirit of our mind or to be renewed in our mind as we view ourselves rightly and we view God rightly. This tendency, by the way, and I won't take time to turn you there. You can make note, 1 Timothy chapter 3, where Paul is talking to Timothy, and he's talking about leadership in the church. And he says, we don't put novices up in the pulpit. We don't put novices in position of leadership, lest they be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. There again, pride and devil going together. So how do you know when pride is taking a hold? How do you know when you might be overtaken in pride? Because isn't that the theme of the age that we live in? Isn't the theme of the age that we need to build people's self-esteem? That you can't love anyone until you right or well until you love yourself completely first? It isn't the, one of the resounding themes and the resounding uh, um, influences in our culture is that we all need, need to make everybody always feel good and, and concerned about themselves and how they are perceived and yet there are some things that we need to watch for that will let us know when we're falling into pride in James chapter 3 if we start in verse 13 we get some exhortation here he says who is wise and understanding among you who's so the wise person the one who is understanding by his good conduct let him show his good works in the meekness the humility the control of wisdom verse 14 but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts do not boast and be false to the truth this is not the wisdom that comes down from above this is earthly unspiritual and demonic for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist there will be disorder and every vile practice. So what are some things that you can look for to monitor your own heart to be aware of? Jealousy. Jealousy. Why do they get credit and I don't get credit? Why do they get to do this and I don't do this? Uh, the, 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 it's envy, but it, it's jealousy, selfish jealousy, selfish ambition, putting yourself forward. And those are denoted in this text by boasting and by lying to make yourself look better, by concealing your weaknesses 
and your faults, feeling the, always feeling the need to defend or to justify yourself before others, when you care more about what others think of you than you care about what your father thinks of you and his work in and through, then you're becoming prideful. Your focus is wrong. A.W. Tozer, In the Pursuit of God, a book that our men went through at a men's retreat not well, a year ago or two years ago, he writes and he says, pride is a burden. Pride creates unnecessary burdens. It's a labor when you are laboring to self-love, and it is a heavy one. Think for yourself whether much of your sorrow, your sorrow, has not arisen from someone who criticizes you. As long as you set yourself up as some little God to which you must be loyal, then there will always be those who delight to affront to your idol. How then can you hope to have some sort of inward peace? The heart, your heart, has a fierce effort to continually seek to protect itself from every slight, to shield its horror from the bad opinion of friend and enemy. It will never let the mind have rest. Continue this fight through the years of your life and the burden will become intolerable. And yet, he says, believers, the sons of God, have no need to carry this burden. While the sons of the earth, those who do not know God, carry it continually. They challenge every word spoken against them. They cringe under every criticism. They smart under each fancied slight, tossing sleepless as if another is preferred before them. But not so us. Jesus calls us first to his rest, and meekness is his method. The meek man cares not at all for who is greater than he. He has long ago decided that the esteem of the world is not worth the effort. He develops toward himself a kindly sense of humor and learns to say, Oh, so you have been overlooked? They've placed someone before you? They've whispered that you are pretty small stuff after all? And now you feel hurt because the world is saying about you the very thing you have been saying about yourself? Only yesterday you were telling God you were nothing, a mere worm of the dust. Where is your consistency? Come on, humble yourself and cease to care what men think. When we talk about pride, sometimes it gets pretty confusing, and I will tell you that it is pervasive. And pride is denoted, or what are symptoms of pride? Include jealousy, selfish ambition, putting yourself forward, saving face, defending yourself, looking better than you look, boasting. One of the diagnostic things that you can do is simply listen to the subject of most of your sentences. Is it always I, I, I? I did this, I do that, I think this, I, I'm this kind of person, I, 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 I? What is the preoccupation of your life? Is it yourself or is it the God who gave life to you and the God who has given his life to you? The address for pride is humility. Doing nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, valuing others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each to the interest of others. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, Proverbs says, but with humility comes wisdom. The world again says that we have a lack of self-esteem. The Bible says that we esteem ourselves too highly. And remember that God opposes the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. So the call when we serve is to continually be on guard against our natural tendency to self-sufficiency, self-reliance, self-aggrandizement, putting ourselves forward, even self-defense. It is to put our focus upon God and who he is and what he is has accomplished and what he is able to accomplish. Now, there's a lot more I'd like to talk about there, but I'm not going to because hey, here's, here's, I think, the, the main point of this passage. And it is we are not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but we're to think sober according to what? According to the measure of faith that God has given to us. Now, here's a question for you, and I want you to engage with me here for a minute to the extent that you're able to. Listen, engage. Do I have more faith than you, or do you have more faith than me? Is more faith required 
of you than me or more faith required of me than you or more faith required of the person sitting over there or the person who gets to have more faith and who gets to have less faith is that, is that the way faith works in scripture you see when I was studying this passage the measure of faith and granted I believe that God certainly gives people the ability and the grace that he pours out upon them he gives grace in varying measure correct Grace according to the calling, grace according to the giftedness, grace according to the need of the moment. But the call to faith and the gift of faith, isn't it the same for everyone? Isn't it the only way we come to God is through faith? Not through some sort of personal expression or personal accomplishment, personal qualification. Let, let me just walk through. We need to understand what it means to live by faith. We need to understand the, the truth of this passage. This will put pride out of the window. This will put pride completely out of the window. We need to understand that we come to God through faith, and then we live by faith. And so look with me really quick. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, same book. Great truth that he was just telling us a little while ago. Uh, that he has been telling us before he wrote this passage of scripture, before we got to 12, he, he laid the groundwork by talking about how we come to God after all. Because God is righteous and we're not. So how do we become righteous, acceptable to God? How does God receive us? Is, do we work our way up to it? Do we, do we gain it? Do we make some sort of progress until God finally says, yeah, good enough, check, you're in, or, or the scales are balanced. No, the righteousness of God has been manifested or revealed apart from the law. What is the law? The law, the law is our code of behavior. It's our definition of righteousness. Apart from the law, because we can't keep the law perfectly, God has manifested. He's revealed. He's shown. He's poured forth His righteousness. Apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Where is the righteousness of God? In Christ Jesus. How do we experience the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? Through faith. For there is no distinction. And you guys remember this, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that there's none righteous, no, not one. But we know equally that all who are saved, all who are declared not guilty, all who are justified, are justified by His grace, undeserved. By His grace as a gift. How? Through the price that Christ paid. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation. He paid the penalty for our sin. He satisfied the righteous wrath of a holy God to be received by faith this was to show God's righteousness and I'm going to stop that we'll stop that section right there but here's the whole point of this passage of scripture how do you get saved how do you get right with God how do you have a relationship with God in the first place God calls you God convicts you God wakes you up and the call is to repent to turn from sin to Christ and to put your faith in him you can't earn this it is by grace through faith and how much faith does it have does it take for you to be saved by the way now just as an aside here when we talk about comparative faith if you will how much faith do you need to move a mountain according to the new testament as much as a grain of mustard seed see here's where i think we get kind of off base when it comes to serving God, presenting our bodies as instruments of righteousness i think we say those guys are super christians they've got great faith but I'm not, a, I'm not a super Christian. And I'm not really, I'm not serving God by being an evangelist. And I'm not serving God by being a, 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 the planter of a great church. And I'm not serving God in this tier here. I, I'm just working in the children's ministry. Or I, I'm, a, I'm a greeter. Or I teach a Sunday school class. Or, or I drive a van. Or I, I, my, my role, my, my ministry is... I don't need that much faith. It's just a little bit. And can I tell you that I believe that the standard of faith that God calls us to and has called us to and gives us to and um, impresses upon us the measure of grace that God has bestowed is the same for everyone. You can't get saved apart from grace. And you can't live obedient to God, free from pride, dependent upon Him, apart from faith. Does that make sense? Let, let, me, let me illustrate. 
First uh, Corinthians chapter 3. Paul was writing a letter to the church at Corinth, and what a church that was. One of the first sins he addressed was that they were in cliques, and they were, they were boasting. They were boasting not in themselves, but they were boasting in who they identified with. I am a disciple of Paul. Oh, I'm one of Apollos' group. Oh, not buddy, me, I'm Cephas, Peter, he's my man. And some of them, we only follow Jesus. And they had this kind of pride by proxy, if, if you will. They were proudful because they were boasting, but they were boasting in competencies, the competencies of a man. And Paul addresses this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, where he talks about, listen, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. Do you guys remember that passage of Scripture? And he says, I'm not here to defend myself. I don't answer to myself. I'm certainly not here to defend myself before you. I don't answer to you. I answer to God. And just because I don't know of anything that, that, that I can accuse myself of doesn't mean I'm guilty. That's up to God. And he says, I have applied these things that I'm talking about in verse 6. He says, I've applied these things that I'm talking about to Apollos and to me uh, for your benefit, that you may learn through our teaching so that you don't go beyond what is written. Why? So that none of you may be puffed up. You know what puffed up is, right? Arrogant, prideful. You may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And that's the phrase that I really want you to focus on. What do you have that you did not receive? Another way James describes is every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. You understand that we don't have anything to be prideful of when we set our attention about God when we live by faith we're not trusting in ourselves we're not trusting in our competencies we're not trusting in in all that we can do we're trusting in what God has done and what God is doing that's what Paul meant when he said in Galatians and so much there but in in, in one passage in Galatians he says I have been crucified to the world and the world to me I don't care what people think I don't care about the enticements in the world that's not my preoccupation. But what he says in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but what, what? Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live how? By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Here's the point. When we serve God, we're going to have a tendency to get pretty prideful pretty quick to get self-sufficient and self-dependent pretty quick. That's why the warning comes seemingly out of order. You would think the warning would come after the job descriptions. No, it comes at the very beginning. Let no man think higher of himself than he ought, but rather he should think about himself with sober judgment according to the measure of faith that God has given. We live by faith. We were saved by faith. We are kept by faith. We walk by faith. And it's not our self-dependence, and it's not our, our successes, it's, it's our accessibility. It's our allowing God to use us for His glory. Pride is dangerous, it's so dangerous. We know of its association with Satan, we already talked about that. Uh, we, we know that it makes God our opposition, our opposer. We've already talked about that. But I'll tell you one I think of the most significant dangers of pride is it removes your dependence from God. One of the things that I've said here many, many times, and I will continue to say, is people will often tell me, well, I can't. And so here's the answer to that. I can't. I can't do all these things he's commanded us to do. The Christian life is a call to do things you can't do. I can't. He never said I could. But he can he always said he would. And so the life which I now live, I live by faith in him. And he lives his life in me and through me for his glory. Well, Paul then goes from verse 3 to verse 4 and 5, and there's a transition there. It's the Greek word gar. It just means for. And it's the next thing. And I believe that it obviously it's intended to continue and kind of round out this thought as he transitions. And verses 4 and 5, he says uh, that uh, we are all part of one body, that we are part of a body together. For as in one body, 
we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually one of, one of another. Here's, you want to help, you want assistance in avoiding the tendency to pride, of falling into the trap of prideful thinking, of independence, of going your own way, of, of self-esteem or self-arrogance. Look around. This image of the body helps us to address that. Our tendency is to think that our work is the best or the hardest or the most significant. But we have people who work with children and youth and those who make coffee, drive vans, run sound and video, sing and play instruments, teach in the classroom, lead in worship, witness in the workplace, in the community, serve in a home group, lead in a home group, visit the homebound. Those who are members of the prayer ministry, the greeter ministry, the guest services ministry, the, the give, and those who give generously, those who lead, organize, plan, develop structures, some out front, some in back, some that we would say are support group, some that we would say are lead group, but all together we, are, we make up one body, one body in Christ, all equally value all steadfast servants all valuable in the role that God assigns in the local congregation and I will tell you one of the dangers of pride is you begin to devalue your brothers and sisters I got this it's up to me I can do this I can do this better than anybody else and you begin to devalue brothers and sisters we are called to value and appreciate our fellow servants. That would be the third point on your outline. It will also keep you in balance. It will keep you focused on God's grace. We are one body. Every part is important. And frankly, it's all about God anyway. It's about God's glory. It's about His name and His reputation. It's about what God does in and through us as a people by His power, dependent upon Him. Listen. I believe God has a great, great future for us as West End Baptist Church. I believe there is such a need for a gospel witness and a gospel presence on this part of Greenville and all around Greenville, and certainly in the different places that we live and that we work and that we come from. But I have seen God do amazing things, not only to place us here, but to keep us here for his glory and I believe that this warning is very important for us to take seriously as individuals and as a congregation I'm going to tell you one of the worst things that can happen to a church is for a church to to begin to pull away from their complete devotion and dependence upon God and to start putting their trust in people and individuals and to start being careful about their opinion and the, how they are viewed by the world around them we want to be an attractive church, but only because Christ is attractive. The gospel is an offense, and so we don't want to add to that offense. We don't want to be personally an offense. We want to be those who display the love and the glory of Christ faithfully, loving one another in such a way that the world knows that we are his disciples. And the biggest harm and the biggest danger or the most immediate thing that we're going to have to continually be aware of is our tendency to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Now, I don't want you to think that that means we should belittle ourselves. That's just another form of pride. You know that, right? When you belittle yourself, the idea there is you're still the subject of the sentence. You're still the direct object of the action. You're still what it's all about. What I want for you and me is for us to be so preoccupied with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. For us to be so preoccupied with who He is and what He has done and what He's doing that we're not our first thought, that we love Him. He's our first thought and that we honor and prefer one another. And we come down the list for God's glory. Father, I want to thank you for the exhortation that we have, the danger, the warning that you have made us aware of. 
I want to thank you for the grace that you have bestowed upon us, for the faith that you have given to us, the faith that you have evoked from us, that we might know you, that we might walk with you, with you that we might live by faith. I pray, Father, that you will protect, pre- protect us from the danger of sinful pride, from the danger of, of, of not humbling ourselves before you. Pray that, I pray that we never get into the place where you have to humble us, but, Father, that we will keep ourselves focused on you, focused on one another, appreciating one another, valuing each other, honoring one another, putting others above ourselves, and most of all, Father, kneeling at your feet, surrendered and yielded to you. Make these truths applied to our hearts. In your name I pray. Amen.